the inside of a church building. God, be with us this morning as we sing our praises to you and as we hear from your word. Lord, remind us of who you are and your greatness. Fill our hearts this morning, God. In your name we pray. Amen. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, hope. Sing, I've tasted and seen. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are with Comfort this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence. Sing, I've tasted and seen. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, oh. Lift us up. Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Comfort this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence. Lord, your presence, Lord. let us become more aware of your presence, let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness.
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Amen. Let's praise him for all he's done this morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Brother Michael, can you hear me out there? We're good. All right. What a gracious and glorious God we do serve. And for the opportunity, even though it's outside, it's still we get to meet and see each other and, and worship and praise our Lord and Savior. So a couple of announcements, uh, several of announcements. Um, I know we're hoping and praying that this COVID-19 is going away and we're on the down side of all this, but um, they're still offering some free testing and all. Um, it says to get in touch with your local health department if anybody needs to be tested or if you know someone who may. Um, and I've got some information here. Uh, see, get with me if you need that. Also, there's a mobile food pantry. Um, it's for several families. It's going to be Monday, May the 11th. Um, and I've got a route here on this map that they're going to be running. Um, and it's from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, and this looks like it's in Hoboken, around Hoboken Elementary School. So uh, if you've got any questions, please get with me. I've got all that up here. And one more thing, um, Skylark, uh, normally the baby bottle campaign that we normally do, um, we're, we're starting that again. Um, and there's different ways to do it. They've set it up a little differently. We still have the baby bottles that you can fill. They're right here in the box. Um, also, there's a... There's a little card we've got here that you can do a virtual bottle. Basically, you can give online and stuff and all, so like that. So if you want any information or any of that, that's up front here, and we can do that. Also, I think the guys, uh, Dwayne's got the basket out here for anybody that wants to drop their tithes off. You can still mail them in. Uh, Tidely is set up on the website, all that. So um, just continue to send your tithes in or mail them or drop them off at the church. Um, but just what an awesome day to be here. It's amazing. The Lord has blessed us with this weather. Uh, so I, I'm just honored to be here. Do we have any other announcements? Anything else? Oh. Yeah, we'll get that. One last thing. Happy Mother's Day to all you mothers. Yeah. Happy Mother's Day. Dad, you must be laying on the horns. Hitting the horn hard there. <laughs> so... Also, we have a little gift for the mothers. If you did not receive one, I, I, I won't be able to see you if you raise your hand. So you either have to stand up or get outside your car or hit the horn or anything. But we've got a little gift over here for all the mothers. But happy Mother's Day. Um, and we hope you enjoy your day with your family. Um, and I'm going to lead us in prayer and I'm going to turn it back over. I, normally we would fellowship. So right now it's hard to do that. So if you just want to look to the car to the left or to the right, just wave at your at your neighbors, all that. We're fellowshipping right here. <laughs> so it's good to see her. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Grace and Heavenly Father, thank you for the mothers that you've put in our lives, for the ones that have influenced us, Father, whether it's our biological mothers or the ones that you have anointed and put in our lives to lead and, and, and influence us, God. Father, we ask you just to lift up all mothers today, and, and any, any and every day, God, not just today, but just special today. Father, let them know how much you love them and, and, and that the families and how much they shape each and every family that they are a part of. God, just thank you for that. Thank you for sending them to us. It's a blessing sometimes we don't think that it is when they're always telling us what to do and we need to do this or that, but God, it's because they love and care so deeply about us and about the families that you've put them in. And so many things go unspoken from them. So just lift up all the mothers today, God. Thank you for allowing us to come, to fellowship, to honor and praise you. And we love you in your name. Amen. Amen. As we continue to worship this morning, uh, Isaiah chapter 40 verse 31 says, But they who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So many times in life I, I try to do things on my own. I, I try to think, oh, I'm 
I'm independent. I can take care of myself. I'm a, I'm an adult. I can adult and do things by myself. And I realize that more and more that I need God. He doesn't need me. He has no need for me whatsoever, but he chooses me and I need him. And I need to take time to stop and to pray and to seek his will on things. And I need to wait on the Lord. Uh, just this past week, time and time again, I, I, I stopped and said, what am I doing? Why am I worrying about this? Why am I fretting over this? I need to stop and I need to pray. I need to wait on God before I move forward in this. Uh, so this morning, I want us to sing those words. Uh, so we're going to join together and sing Everlasting God. Sing, strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God. The everlasting God. You do not thank you all go weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings like eagles. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deliverer. You are the everlasting God, the everlasting God. You do not thank you all, go weary. You're the defender of the weak. You comfort those in need. You lift us up on wings. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. Oh, because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows. 
share this next song with you uh when brother andy told me his plan for this sunday's message i, I said there's no better song to compliment that message and prepare our hearts for his word than uh this song and i want us to listen and meditate on these words and think about all the things that god's done for us even when uh, the future seems cloudy and uncertain when uh we're going through these troubles and these trying situations god's got a plan and he's going to use this for his glory and for our good. There is strength within the sorrow. There is beauty in our tears. And you meet us in our morning with a love that cast out fears. You are working in our waiting, sanctifying us. And beyond our understanding, you're teaching us to trust. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever. Perfect in love, you are sovereign over us. You are wisdom unimagined. Who could understand your ways? Reigning high above the heavens. Reaching down in endless grace. You are the lifter of the lonely. Compassionate and kind. You surround and you uphold me. And your promises. My delight, your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Even what the enemy meant for evil, you're turning for our good. You're turning for our good and for your glory. 
Even in the valley you are faithful You're working for our good You're working for our good And for your glory Even what the enemy means for evil You're turning for our good You're turning for our good And for your glory Even in the valley you are faithful You're working for our good You're working for our good For your glory Your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire of the flood Faithful forever Perfect in love You are sovereign over us Faithful forever Perfect in love You are sovereign over us You are sovereign over us Amen. Amen. I don't know if my voice carries as, as loud as others, so I'm going to get as close as I can to this mic. Okay, can you hear? I'm going to take that as a no. <laughs> Can anybody hear? Yeah. Yeah. Listen, listen, I, I tell you what, Mother's Day is a very special day. This day is special for every single person, whether you're a mother or you're not, because if you're here, you're here because you have a mother. Amen. And that should make the day special. Now, one wise person said one time, if you've got a good mother, you should be thankful because not everybody does. But if you have special memories, then that is a blessing. God has blessed you with that. You know, I thought about today being Mother's Day, and I said, you know, how can we honor our mothers? Ultimately, we want to honor God, and we will honor God. And I thought about all the beautiful pictures that many of you are posting on Facebook of you and your mom, or maybe you and your grandmother, or your grandmother and your mother together, or or whatever that, that scenario may be, and and, and I've read captions about, oh, how beautiful she is, or she's a Proverbs 31 woman. And, and I thought of all of those things, and I said, that would make a great sermon. But that's not what I'm thinking of today. What I'm thinking of today, when I think of my mother, who I have to be careful because she's right over there. My mother always had these little phrases that she would say that would make me pause in my steps. Something like this. Just because everybody else does it, does that mean you're going to do it too? But I think it sounded more like this, Miss Teresa. Just because your friends jump in the fire, does that mean you're going to jump in the fire too? She would always say things just like that, right at the moment that they needed to be said. I didn't always appreciate it at the time, but I do now. You know, that was a beautiful song. Bill, and that, that, I tell you what, this, this is here to, to, to protect us from the coronavirus, right? But it's also a cheer wiper <laughs> and other things. I tell you, it was absolutely beautiful. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. You know, I've heard that growing up, and I think that was, was, was said by my mother. What so many other people mean for evil, you know what, God means it for good. And I started looking, I was like, where does that come from? Does anybody know where that comes from in the Bible? Does anybody know what book that comes from? you got to go all the way back to the very beginning, Miss Sissy. Back to the book of Genesis. That was the words of Joseph. You remember Joseph and his coat of many colors? It's the story of Joseph. It's at the, that at the end of Genesis, as far as you can get before... You have the end of Genesis and you move on to ex Exodus. He's speaking to his brothers. Listen, that comes to my mind because there's been a lot of questions that I've heard mothers asking lately, women asking lately, 
but not only women, people in general. Questions like this. Are we living in the end times? Is COVID-19 pandemic, is, this, is, is it this one world order conspiracy against our nation? Is it against our president? Is it against our democracy? Is it against life as we know it? Has this virus been planted and has it been spread by conspirators while these very rich billionaires are developing a vaccine and they're going to offer us solutions if we'll just submit to those solutions and allow the chip to be implanted and the needle to be inserted? Is the government taking over? Is the government increasing in power and authority while stripping us of ours? Is this the end of the nation as we know it? And while these are good questions to ask, as a matter of fact, our Lord and Savior Jesus said we should be cautious and we should be vigilant. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Jesus said this. He said, Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be shrewd as serpents and innocent as what? Doves. As innocent as doves. You know, even Jesus' disciples had questions about the end times. They were wondering even way back then if they were standing and breathing in the end of the times. If you go to Matthew chapter 24, it begins in verse, verse number 3. Seriously, if you have your Bible, you ought to look here and, and mark it because it's very, it makes some very good reading. I'm going to skim over it because I think it's pretty, pretty fitting for today. Matthew chapter 24, verse 3, it says, As Jesus and his disciples, they're sitting there on the Mount of Olives. The disciples come and they said, Tell us, Master, when are these things going to happen? Um, tell us about your coming and the end of the age. And verse 4, it says, Jesus answered and he said to them, See to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will, and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not frightened, for those things must take place, but that's not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and in various places there will be famines, and there will be earthquakes. But all of these things are merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will deliver you to tribulation, and they will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many will fall away and they will betray one another and they will hate one another. And there will be many false prophets will rise and they will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. Verse 15, therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of through Daniel, the prophet standing in the holy place, let the reader understand then those who are in Judea must flee to the mountains. Whoever is on the mount, on the housetop must not go down and get his things that are in his house. Whoever is in the field must not turn back to get his cloak. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. But pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on a Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not occurred since the beginning of the world until now, nor ever will. I'm going to skip over to verse 29, but it says, But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the sky to the other. Listen, there's a lot of things that I don't know. But there's one thing that I'm certain of regarding the end times. We're one day closer today than we were yesterday. Amen. Amen. Jesus is coming. And when he comes, he is coming in victory. He is coming in triumph. And from what I understand, there's going to be no tears in heaven. There's going to be no crying. This is something that, that, that the church gets in, excited for, that we stand in anticipation that the victory is ours. It's, it's ours because Jesus rose from the dead. If you go all the way back to Matthew 28, verse 1 through, through 9, it's a beautiful account that Mary and the uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, they make their way to the tomb on that, on that particular what we celebrate as Easter Sunday. And they make their way to the tomb expecting to see a body there that they're going to anoint. But when they arrived, there was a, an earthquake and the stone had been rolled away and there was an angel sitting there. And the angel says, what are you looking for? Jesus, he is risen just like he said that he would go. 
And as they make their way back to the disciples, Jesus appears and scripture says at that moment that they fall to his feet and they begin to worship him. Why? Because he rose just like he said he was. The victory is ours because Jesus rose from the dead, just like he said that he would. And because of that, we can have the assurance of our salvation and our future. To that, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gathering this morning and the opportunity to come together to hear your word. The Father, as we begin to dig a little deeper, Lord, would you open our hearts? Would you open our ears and allow our minds to receive your message and for it to penetrate even deeper into our soul, Lord, so that we can be forever changed because of your word, God? And that we will live it out in our homes. We'll live it out with our spouses, with our children. In such a way, Father, that when others look at us, they will see Jesus' light shining. Lord, that is our prayer. Someone's life will be touched by the gospel of Jesus Christ through us. And that they too will have eternal salvation, eternal security in you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. But even though we know of that victory... Even though we know what Matthew 28 tells us, so many of us today seem to be walking around in fear. And I tell you, I feel ridiculous wearing this thing. I do. I just came from northeast Georgia, where it is now the new hot spot, Hall County, which is where my little grandbaby is still in NICU, in a hospital where the National Guard is set up outside under a tent. It breaks my heart. That, that, that his father hasn't even been able to hold him yet because of this thing. We haven't been able to lay eyes on them. We've only seen pictures yet. So we walk around in fear and we talk of our worries and we talk of our anxieties. Worse yet, we live in a state of indifference as though it doesn't even affect us at all. Or complacency. Oh, well. But in Genesis chapter 50, we have a beautiful picture here. It's the end of Jacob's life. Israel's life, if you will, Jacob's life is the end of his life. This is Joseph's father, the one who gave him this coat of many colors. In the air, you can still smell the fresh earth. It has just been packed over Jacob's grave. And Joseph's brothers, they began to recall all the evil things that they had done to their brother early on. And all of a sudden, they begin to be filled with anxiety and worry and fear, wondering, is their brother going to respond with retaliation? Is he going to come back? And is he going to just stomp them out? Does he hold a grudge against us is what they wonder. But in Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, this is what Joseph says. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God... He meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Listen, there, there's a lot we don't understand. There's questions that we've raised. Evil that is encroaching on our territory. But like Joseph, who lived in obedience, he lived in, in fear of our God. We can charge into the future with our heads held high and our victory swords raised because we know that what man means for evil, God intends for good. Listen, there's a lot of things we can learn from Joseph's lives that we can apply to our circumstances today. And I want to share just a few of those with you. Listen, if you're taking notes, this is number one. Number one, and I can almost hear the voice of every mother in this place right now. Because this sounds like a list that would come from my mother. And maybe that's why when I was pinning it this week, <laughs> I was thinking of my mother because I could hear her saying this. Number one, listen for God's voice. Listen for God's instruction. I can almost see me with, with my bag packed, ready to go. I'm going to head off to, to college. And my mom would, would, would be standing there saying, listen, listen for God's voice. Listen for his instructions. Don't you move until you have it. In Genesis chapter 37, Joseph is only 17 years of age. And he has two dreams. In verse number seven, it says this. We were binding sheaves in the field. And lo, my sheep rose up and also stood erect. And behold, your sheaves gathered around and they bowed down to my sheep. Now, Joseph's family didn't appreciate hearing this dream, particularly his brothers. Verse nine, he has the other dream and he relays that to his brothers and his mom and dad. He says this. He says, lo, I have had still yet another dream. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars were bowing down to me. 
Now, this is prophecy. This is what is going to happen in the future, that sun and the moon would be his mother and his father. The 11 stars would be his brothers, that there would come a great famine in the land. And, and Joseph would be in a position in Egypt where he is second in command. And, and because of this plan that God lays upon his heart, he is able to, to take seven good, plentiful years and to store up wheat and all the 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 bounty of the land so that when the seven years of famine come, that people are fed from the storehouses. And Joseph is in charge of this whole operation. And there will come a day when his family who is starving will arrive at his doorstep, not recognizing him as to who he is. They will bow down before him, the sun and the moon and the 11 stars. Prophecy of all that that, that, that was going to happen in the life of Joseph and his family in all of Egypt during that particular time. So then we ask, all right, if we're listening for the voice of God, if we're listening for God's instructions in our own lives, we have to wonder then, does God still speak to us in dreams like he did Joseph? Joseph had two dreams. I think of the Old Testament characters. I think of even New Testament characters. There's another Joseph in the New Testament in the Gospels that also receives a, a dream that he should take Mary as his wife. So God, oftentimes he communicated through dreams in the Bible. But how about today? Does he do that? You know, we have the written word of God today. I don't know about you, but I pray that whenever we, we come against a conflict or a struggle that's greater than, than, than we can imagine, that we run to the word of God, that we cling to the word of God, that we search the word of God for answers. We search for truths. We search for a comforting, feel, for a com comforting word that we need. But today, I'm, I'm so afraid that, that, that people have, have neglected the word of God. Listen, if God speaks to us in dreams, then I would say we need to go and take a nap. We need to get a little bit more sleep. But I tell you what, as, as I look at the, the church across the world today, I'm afraid there's too many who have fallen asleep. So I, so I wonder, is it, is it sleep that we need or is it that we need to be running to the word of God? Listen, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, speaking of the word of God, it says, For the word of God is living, is active, is sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, it says, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed accurately handling the word of God. And then Psalm 119, verse 105, you probably have it memorized. Your word is a what? A lamp to my feet. It is a light to my path. If these are true about God's word and, and the times that we live in are so uncertain, shouldn't it be that we should be running to the word of God? We should be in the word of God. It's the instructions about how to live. I tell you what, if there's anything that I have learned during this COVID-19 pandemic, it is this. Regardless of what your opinion is on any particular subject, if you look hard enough on your cell phone or the Internet, you will find a professional who, with scientific evidence and an MD behind his name, will agree with you. Whether to wear the mask or not. Listen, this is the thing. You can be... Completely assured that your position is 100% correct, you can find a doctor who will support what you say is true and provide evidence, and you can be completely wrong and die. Somebody's supposed to say amen to that. But I can tell you one thing. There's one thing that will not ever let you down, and that is the word of God. God does not lie. He will give you life. If you will believe it, if you will obey it, if you will Live it. Believe it, obey it, and live it. Believe it, obey it, and live it. This is the word of God. We should listen for God's voice. We should run to God's word. We should run to his instructions. That's number one. Listen to the story. So Joseph's brothers, they hate him all the more because of his dreams. Oh, they just want to have a plot to do away with him. Listen, I'm here to tell you, the more you choose to believe God's word, to obey God's word, to live it out each and every day, there's going to be those that are going to come in conflict against you. They're going to hate you. They're going to plot to destroy you because there is an enemy that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. 
If you're going to God's word, the phone is going to ring. If you're trying to go to God's word, that's when Avi is going to wake up. When you try to go to God's word, that's when the dog is going to bark and want to go outside or something's going to happen. It just seems as, as though that's what happens. But we go to God's word. At first, Joseph's brothers, it was a cistern. It was a well that was empty. It didn't have water in it. Their plan was to, was to kill him and throw his body into the well. Second, they kind of backed off of that plan and they decided, well, let's just throw him into the well. And, and Reuben said, well, I'll come back later and pull him out. But lo and behold, there were some traveling Ishmaelites that were cut off in the distance. They were traitors. So the brothers thought they could make a little money off their brother. So they, so they sold Joseph. He, they, sold, they sold him to the traveling Ishmaelites who then went into Egypt and they, they put him up on the slave auction block there. And they, and, and they sold him. He ends up in, in, in the home of Potiphar, who is the captain of the guard. So it's there that, that you have this favored son now becomes a slave. He becomes a house servant to Potiphar. But what's interesting is about Joseph is Joseph remembers who he is. He remembers that he is a child of the one true king. He is God, a son of God. He's, and because of who he is, a God follower, he seeks to obey and to honor God and to live out the principles each and every day. And Potiphar is watching and Potiphar elevates him to the status of being in charge of his whole entire household. But it's not only Potiphar who is taking note of Joseph. Scripture says that Mrs. Potiphar is also taking notice of Joseph. Scripture says that, that he was well built in form and stature. And on one particular day, when no one else is in the house, Miss Potiphar says, Joseph, you come and you lie with me. And to that, verse 12 says, Joseph left his garment in her hand and he fled. He ran and he went outside. Joseph avoided temptation at all costs. He got out of there. Listen, they say that sexual temptation is perhaps the strongest. And I believe that is true unless you're an alcoholic. They say sexual temptation is the strongest, and I believe that's true, unless you're a druggie. They say sexual temptation is the strongest, and I believe it's true, unless, of course, you're addicted to food, power, control. You fill it in. It could be shopping, whatever it may be. Whatever your temptation is, listen, the devil knows where you are weak. And he will sit there and he will pick and pick and pick and pick and pick and continue to pick and pick and pick. Trying so desperately to get you to fold. Because that's what the enemy does. He's wicked. So number two, if you're taking notes, what do we learn from Joseph? Not only do we go to the word of God, we listen to his voice. But number two, we run from temptation. We flee. We get out of there. Listen, the devil, he is a master tempter. James 4, 7 says this. It says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. To resist the devil means we must know the word of God. We must stand strong in our convictions and we have to run from evil. Listen, there's a temptation today to let the government have more control, to offer us stimulus checks, to help us out, to tell us where we can go, to tell us where we can't go, what to wear and, 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 and when to wear it, or whether we can have church or if we can't have church and how we can have church and all these different things. Listen, Gerald Ford said this. I love this quote. Former president of the United States of America said this. A government big enough to give you everything you want is a government big enough to take from you everything you have. Listen, I'm not proposing that we rise up against our leaders. I'm not proposing that we boycott their orders and we put our families at risk or our neighbors at risk. I'm not proposing that at all because I believe what the Bible says about leadership is true. Listen to this. First Peter chapter two, verse 13 through 20 says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as the one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. Act as free men and do not use your freedom as a covering for evil, but use it as bond slaves of God. Honor all people. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect. 
not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor. What I am proposing, however, is that as believers in Jesus Christ, as followers of Jesus, as Christians, that we get involved in leadership, that we get involved in our government. The government is the people, right? So we we are to get involved. Listen, run for office. Know those who you vote for. Make sure that you put in the position of authority people that you know have good biblical morals and values and Christ-like character and biblical beliefs. Listen, it's easier to submit to someone that you know and that you love than someone that you don't know much about and who is opposed to the things that you believe in. I tell you what, it would it would be a wonderful thing if you were to call up your mayor and ask them to come have dinner with you and your family, or you were to call your representative, and you think, well, my representative is too busy. They wouldn't come have dinner with me. Well, call them and invite them anyways. What if they said yes? Huh. What if you had your state representative come to your living room and eat from your table? Why not? They're just people. And we need to know those people because those people are making decisions that will affect your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren who have yet to be born. We need to know these people. That's what I am proposing. So we're to run from temptation, Joseph says. We are to to flee. Do what he did. Run from temptation at all costs. Get out of there. Listen, I would even dare say put down your cell phone if that is your temptation. Alcohol, whether it's sexual, whether it's pornography, whether it's drugs or power or control or or always this 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 want to be right. I want to always be right above you or or I'm going to pout if I don't get my way. Whatever that temptation is. Lay it down, flee from it, get away from it. So Joseph, he ends up in prison. Mrs. Potiphar concocts a lie about Joseph. Mr. Potiphar comes home, he hears the lies. So Joseph spends, does anybody know how many years he, he spends behind bars? Two years he is locked up. But for two years, despite the circumstances and the situation, Joseph remains faithful to God. The jailer notices God, notices Joseph's demeanor and puts him in charge of all the other prisoners. But one particular day, Joseph's chief cupbearer and the baker end up in prison with Joseph. They each have, 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 have had a dream. And it's amazing. God uses Joseph in order to provide interpretation to their dreams. And what's interesting is that in the next days, that the the days that come, the events that occurred in the dreams actually come true, just as Joseph had interpreted, as he had predicted. And all Joseph says is to the cupbearer is, hey, when you're restored to your position, will you remember me before a Pharaoh? And of course, the cupbearer forgets Joseph. That seems to be his story. People just keep forgetting about Joseph. But you know what? There is one who did not, does not, and will not forget about Joseph. And he will not, he does not, and he cannot forget about you. And that is our Heavenly Father God. One day, Pharaoh has a dream. Pharaoh has a dream. He is troubled by his dream. There's no one there who can interpret his dream. And the cupbearer remembers Joseph. And he remembers Joseph before Pharaoh. And he says, there was a, there was a time when, when, when I and, and your baker offended you and you threw us into jail and we each had a dream. And there was a Hebrew youth there who was able to provide dream interpretation and the events came true. Just as he said, you should summon him. And that's exactly what happened. Pharaoh had Joseph summoned and he came before him and he stood and he, he listened to Pharaoh's dream and then God Allow Joseph to provide dream interpretation. And I love what it says in Genesis chapter 41, verse 16. From the mouth of Joseph, before Pharaoh, he stands before the most powerful man who can provide him, released from prison. He says this to Pharaoh. He says, it is not in me. Dream interpretation is not in me. He says, God will give Pharaoh the answer that he wishes. God, it is God who will give and, and and we know that 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 is exactly what happened. If you go and you and you and you begin to read this this story, Joseph offers a suggestion for the people's survival, a plan to be implemented, 
And Joseph is put in charge of all of Egypt. There's no one more powerful than him except Pharaoh himself. So he's second in command. So number three, if you're taking notes that we learn from the life of Joseph, is this. Recognize it is God, not us, who is in control. Recognize that it is God, that it is not us, who is in control. And because of that, you give him the glory and you give him the recognition. Listen, God is sovereign. He has all authority and God is love. He is sovereign. Listen to Psalm 47, verse 2. It says this, for the Lord most high is to be feared, a great king over all the earth. He is sovereign. You cannot change the outcome of the future. We can we can wear our mask. We can wash our hands. We can practice social distancing. But we're not going to change the pandemic. It's going to do what the pandemic is supposed to do. But we can do our part. We can't much change that outcome. But we can know that God is sovereign, that he has all control over all that will happen. But not only that, he's also he has all authority. Listen to Romans chapter 13, verse one. It says this. For there is no authority except from God. Now, before that, there's a little phrase that actually goes back. It says this. Every person is to be in subjection to the governing authorities. But we've already talked about that. But what's interesting, again, is it says, for there is no authority except from God. And then God is love. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. What? He gave. What did he give? His only begotten son. That what? If we would just believe in him, we would have everlasting life. Listen, Joseph is used by God to implement the plan to save a nation from famine. God is reunited with Joseph. God is reunited with Joseph. God reunites Joseph with his family. God provides for his family. God will move his whole entire family to Egypt. And it's God that's doing the moving. It's God that's doing all the provision and the protection. And then comes the day where Joseph's father, Jacob, he dies. He dies in the land of Egypt. And it's at that moment that, that Joseph's brothers begin to fear. What will Joseph do? Will he hold a grudge against us? I want to pause for, 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 for just a moment here. And I want to go back to, to what I just said, that it's God that does the reuniting. It's God that does the moving. It's God that, that is orchestrating the events. Because we're talking about the sovereignty of God and how God is in control. The other night, we, um, we had an opportunity to have dinner with, with Olivia and Riley. Well, it would be Riley's parents, Olivia's in-laws, and a couple of members from, from their gathering called the Delonica Ecclesia. And they were gathered there in Jeff and Maureen's living room. And, and we had gotten there early and we had had dinner. And... Um, Olivia walked in. Olivia and Riley walked in. They were a little bit later. And Olivia came and immediately just broke into tears. She hadn't been wanting to get around people. She's been trying to stay away from people because she has come home from the hospital, but she feels that she's supposed to have her baby with her, that something is missing. And leaving him in NICU under all of these restrictions, only being able to be there two hours a day, and, and, and it's just so many regiments and all of, all of these different things. She walks into the living room. She just breaks down into tears. And she sits next to her mother on the couch. And everyone in that, that living room just gets quiet. And no one says a word. We're just sitting there feeling her pain. Hearing her weeping on the couch. And to break that silence, not really knowing what to do, I kind of in a jokingly way, spoke up and said, you know, there's enough of us here. Let's just all go down there and let's just show them who's in charge and let's grab Liam and pull him out of that NICU. They remain quiet, awkward. And then Jeff spoke up and he said, you know, this reminds me of our God and that he's still in control. And he said, you know what, this reminds me of a song. So everyone in, in that living room started singing that song together, just offering praises to God right there through that song. And that song led to another song, which led to another one. About four songs later, Maureen says, you know, this week God showed me this Bible verse and she shares a Bible verse talking again about the sovereignty of God. It's not the government that has Liam in an ICU 
It's not the hospital staff that has him walked away. God has Liam exactly where he needs him at this moment. And we trust him. Because God is sovereign. He's sovereign in this little baby's life. He's only a week old, a week and a day. And he's sovereign in your life. And he will continue to be sovereign in our life. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Joseph says this. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. Listen, like Joseph, we live in uncertain times, uncertain circumstances, but we too, we can be obedient to God, trusting in him, leaning into him. Number one, we listen for his voice. We listen for his instructions. Number two, we run from temptation. We flee. We get away from it. Number three, we recognize that it is God, not us, who is in control. That it is God who is in charge. Thomas Roberts, many of you have probably, I'm going to end with this, wrote this poem. It's gone viral. It's called The Great Realization. Has anybody heard it? Anybody heard this? It's about, a, it's, it's about um, a dad tucking in his little boy. Listen to this. Tell me the one about the virus again, then I'll go to bed. But my boy, you're growing weary, sleepy thoughts about your head. Please, that one's my favorite. I promise just once more. Okay, snuggle down, my boy. Though I know you know full well, the story starts before then in a world I once would dwell it was a world of waste and wonder, of poverty and plenty, back before we understood why hindsight's 2020. You see, the people came up with companies to trade across all lands, but they swelled and got much bigger than we could have ever planned. We'd always had our wants, but now it got so quick. You could have everything you dreamed of in a day and with a click. We noticed families had stopped talking. That's not to say they never spoke. But the meaning must have melted and the work-life balance broke. And the children's eyes grew squarer and every toddler had a phone. They filtered out the imperfections, but it missed the noise they felt alone. And every day the skies grew thicker till you couldn't see the stars. So we flew in planes to find them while down below we filled our cars. We'd drive around all day in circles. We had forgotten how to run. We swapped the grass for tarmac shrunk the parks till there were none. We filled the sea with plastic because our waste was never capped. Until each day when you went fishing, you'd pull them out already wrapped. And while we drank and smoked and gambled, our leaders taught us why it's best not to upset the lobbies. It's more convenient to die. But then in 2020, a new virus came our way. The governments reacted and told us all to hide away. While well, we were all hidden amidst the fear and all the while, the people dusted off their instincts. They remembered how to smile. They started clapping to say thank you and calling up their moms. And while the car keys gathered dust, they would look forward to their runs. And while the skies less full of voyagers, the earth began to breathe. And the beaches bore new wildlife that scuttled off into the seas. Some people started dancing, some were singing, some were baking, but grown so used to bad news. But some good news was in the making. So when we found the cure and were allowed to go outside, we all preferred the world we found to the one we'd left behind. Old habits became in extinct and they made way for the new. And every simple act of kindness was now given its due. But why did it take a virus to bring the people back together? Well, sometimes you've got to get sick, my boy, before you start feeling better. Now lie down and dream of tomorrow and all the things that we can do. And who knows, if you dream hard enough, maybe some of them will come true. We now call it the great realization. And yes, since, there, since then there have been many. But that's the story of how it started and why hindsight's 2020. It's almost as though Thomas Roberts, who wrote that, 
must have been paying attention to Romans chapter 8, verse 28, where Paul says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the life of Joseph and how we can glean from him some truths, Lord, that given circumstances such as this, Lord, that we should always listen for your voice. We should listen and heed your instructions that, Father, that we should run from temptation. We should flee from temptation. We should resist the devil and he will flee from us. And, Father, we should always recognize that it is you that is in control. It's not us who is in charge. And what man meant for evil, Father God, you can mean for good. God, we may not understand why we're living in these days, but God, if it's taking these times and these days to get our attention, to get us back on our knees, to, to help us to, to focus our lens and to put it back on you so that we can see the face of Jesus right before us and we can lean into you, Lord Jesus, and give you our troubles and give you our sorrows, but hold our head up high and breathe a, a breath of fresh air and know that the victory sword is in our hands and that we can wave it because the victory is ours. It's ours because we know Jesus. Father, hallelujah, we praise your name. And Father, my prayer is that there is anyone within the sound of my voice who is yet to feel the victory, who, who yet feels the confidence that we gather from or that we have from knowing Jesus. That person can know Jesus today by simply surrendering to our Lordship, to Jesus and saying, Lord Jesus, Forgive me of my sin. Forgive me of wanting to go my way when it's your way that is best. It's your way that is sovereign. It's your way that is for our good and for your glory. I want to submit to your way, Lord. Forgive me of my sins. And I know that you took the punishment for my sin when you went to that cross on Calvary and you laid your life down. And you bled, Lord, your body was shed. It shed blood for, my, for the covering of my sin. But you didn't stay dead. You rose victoriously over that grave. And because this is true, by just simply receiving your free gift of salvation, you will have eternal life, an eternal relationship, that your sin punishment has been taken away from you, and now you are one with Jesus. Oh, Lord Jesus, come and fill me. Be my Savior. Be my Savior. Holy Spirit, come and dwell within me, Lord. Lead me and guide me and direct me. And Father, during these uncertain times, my confidence and my faith is in you. Thank you for all that you're doing and all that you plan to do. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Even what the enemy meant for evil, you're turning for our good. You're turning for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. Even with the enemy meant for evil, you're turning for our good. You're turning for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. Even what the enemy meant for evil, you're turning for our good. You're turning for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. Sing that.
that again, your plans. Your plans are still to prosper. You have not forgotten us. You're with us in the fire and the flood. Faithful forever, perfect in love. You are sovereign over us. You are sovereign over us. You are sovereign over us. Sing that bridge one more time. Even what the enemy meant for evil, you're turning for our good. You're turning for our good and for your glory. Even in the valley, you are faithful. You're working for our good. You're working for our good and for your glory. 